here and uh, ask Lord God that you would um, give us a new vision, uh, a new leading. Father, uh, open our eyes where we may be closed and open our ears where we may be not hearing you distinctly. And Father, uh, God, just lead us in your ways. In Jesus' name. people out thinking that there's a floating face up on stage <laughs> so we, we'll just keep adjusting eventually one of these days it'll work so welcome to those joining us online and welcome to those here in the building it is great to be together and um, regardless of how we gather or where we gather God is with us right so this is good this is good all right well um, we are starting on a new journey together. We have completed a journey in 1 John, which is exciting. And today we're going to talk about something else. Before we jump into that, I just you know, want to acknowledge that our world around us continues to be crazy. If you're here in the uh, Pacific Northwest, have you enjoyed our smoke these last few days? Has that not been crazy? It felt like... Well, Fred referred to it as a nuclear winter. I think that's maybe a slight exaggeration. But um, it definitely felt, didn't it feel like it was dark all day long? Like it was, like, did, did, were you reminded that we're maybe late fall, early, early winter already? And yet it wasn't, right? Uh, 
So it, it seems like with all the fires, I mean, it seems like California, all of California on fire, lots of fires in in Oregon, fires here. I mean, there's just uh, weather disasters. There are, uh, you know, like relational disasters going on. There are cultural clashes going on. It's just, does it seem to you that the world has just gone crazy? Am I the only one who thinks that? I think the world has gone crazy. And um, part of that is that we might have taken a left turn away from God. I mean, in my personal life, when my son Harrison took a left turn away from God, as I call it, at age 12, his life started crashing and it became a disaster. And it seems like as we look around, um, our nation, our area even, and our world, it seems like things have become a disaster. And this isn't about which side you fall on politically. I think we can all agree that there's divisiveness, divisiveness, there is, there is just challenges. We certainly can all agree that there's natural issues going on as well as economic and otherwise. And the fun pandemic continues, mask wearing, um, and all. So I want to tell you about something called the return. I don't know if you've heard of it. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may not have heard of it. But um, you can find the information on the website, thereturn.org. Something that's going on spiritually in our nation is that there are people, pockets all over the place, of people who are starting to focus on repentance and revival and prayer. Some of it coordinated and some of it just also happening all around the same time because we are coming up on the Jewish, the two Jewish high and holy days. One is Rosh Hashanah, if you have heard of that, and one is Yom Kippur. Now, to me, that has meant very little. I apologize to all my Jewish um, friends or acquaintances, but apparently it's a big day. And the return.org um, is led by someone who is Jewish, um, but he believes in Jesus, so he's a Messianic Jew. And he started this out, well, he's doing a daily devotional on the return.org, and we started this 75 days ago. So he's been preparing for this. And other, like Andre and Lutz is part of this, and there's going to be a gathering on the National Mall, and they're really calling all people to a national day of prayer and repentance. Because we have turned away from God. You can find, there's a, on the, in the about section on the website, there's a call to all people, there's a, a global assembly, there's local life um, simulcast going on, but you can also personally participate. But basically what's happening is that on Rosh Hashanah, which is one of the two high holy days, which commemorates the sixth day of creation in the Jewish you know, thinking. And it is the beginning of the 10 days of awe, where they focus on introspection and repentance every year. But this year, um, especially, and I looked up, okay, what does repentance mean? It is the activity of reviewing one's action and feeling contrition or regret for past wrongs, which is accompanied by commitment to an actual to actual action, commitment to and actual actions that show proof of change for the better. You know how people in your life may say sorry, but you know it's just words. That's not what repentance is. It's the kind of sorry where you're about to do something about it. You don't just say sorry, you actually feel sorry and you act on it. So Rosh Hashanah in 2020 is starts on the eve of uh, September 18th and continues through Sunday eve uh, September 20th, and it is the, the first day of the seventh month in the Jewish calendar called Tishrei. And this then, 10 days later, after these 10 days of introspection, leads to Yom Kippur, and that is Sunday, uh, September 27th at sunset through nightfall on the 28th. And it is for the Jews the holiest day of the year. It's when the Jews feel closest to God. It is the Day of Atonement. We can find about it in Leviticus 16.33 where it says, Then he shall make, the priest, atonement for the 
for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. For on this day, God will forgive you that you may be cleansed from all your sins before God. So, I want us to be aware of this, the return.org, and this, these eight, you know, these days, 18 through 28, which are the 10 days, and on the 26th of September is, is the return event. And what they're doing is they're trying to call all Christians and all people, regardless, you know, of denomination or whatever, to this repentance, to get serious, because, um, Jonathan Kahn, that's, that's the guy who's leading that, this, feels that this may be one of a few times in our lifetime where, and this is being a very critical time, where if we don't, the consequences are going to be on our own head. And I don't know about you, but it doesn't look like we're going in a super good direction right about now. And we need to probably go before the Lord as a nation, as a state, as individuals. And one of the interesting things that I read as far as the last time a solemn assembly was called here in the United States, you know how far back that is? Just guess in your head. All the way to Abraham Lincoln. So maybe you're just a little behind on catching up with God and, and getting ourselves straightened out. Because I don't know about you, but for me, as I'm looking at the world around us, and I know about Daniel and Revelation, I'm kind of thinking, boy, it is starting to look a lot like what that is talking about. I don't know if you think that way, but I think that way. And maybe that says more about me than what's going on. But regardless, I would like us to invite us to, to check that out. We're going to send out a 10-day a prayer guide starting on the from the 18th. And if you want to follow along, great. If you don't feel called to participate in this, that's that's totally your choice. But I want today to focus on repentance and next week to focus on revival because it also ties in with where we're going to go in our series. And we're going to start in Galatians. I really feel like God has led us to Galatians. And boy, would you agree with me that the Apostle Paul may know a little something about repentance? <laughs> you probably know the story about him. He was probably born in 5 AD, or I don't know what the new letters are. I'm just going to call it AD. That's what I know. That's what I grew up with. I'm sure there's better, better ways to say it. He was a Benjamite. His father was a Pharisee. He was born in Tarsus. He was a Roman citizen. We know all this from the Bible. He had a sister in Jerusalem, and a nephew was mentioned. He learned tent making, but at about age maybe 10, between 10 and 15, so maybe even 12, you know, 13, bar mitzvah age, he moved to Jerusalem to study under a man called Gamaliel. And he, we find Gamaliel in the book of Acts during the time that Peter and John are being questioned, and he's the one who cautions them, um, saying, if this move is from God, you're not going to stop it. You know, and if it isn't from God, it'll stop itself. And so this Gamaliel is what Paul studied under. And he probably, so it turns out that Jesus probably was crucified in AD 30, which isn't normally what we think, because we think he started his ministry at age 30. Zero is when he was born, but it turns out he was actually before, born before zero. This is beyond uh, my area of expertise, so don't ask me. But Pharisee, he probably became a Pharisee around the year 31, and he was passionate about keeping, keeping the law. He was a rule follower to the nth degree, right? I mean, you want to look in the dictionary next to the word rule follower, you could find the Apostle Paul because he took the law and God's instructions super, super seriously. In fact, he became the chief persecutor of Christianity. He was alive while, and in Jerusalem while Jesus was preaching. He had certainly known of him. He probably was among the Pharisees calling for his crucifixion. We're not told that, but it stands to reason. Since he was in Jerusalem, he was the chief persecutor one year after the crucifixion already. 
and he was looked uh, to. So he, we're told in Acts uh, chapter 8, that he was there at the stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. The cloaks of the people stoning Stephen were at Paul's feet. He was still called Saul then. And he approved of the action. And then it says in Acts, um, and this would have been in the year 32, so only two years after Jesus died. And it says in Acts 8-2 that then a great persecution broke out. After the stoning of Stephen, it was like the, 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 the gates you know, were swung wide open. The, the, uh, it was just an all-out war against these followers of the way, as they were called the way of Jesus, those followers, they were trying to eradicate them because they messed things up. They didn't follow the law as prescribed by the Pharisees. They also threatened their power structure. The Sadducees were, um, you know the joke, right? You know, Sadducees didn't believe in, if don't believe in eternal life, so they're sad, you see. So that's how you can remember that. And the Pharisees were the teachers of the law, and the Pharisees were the, the rule keepers. The Sadducees and the Pharisees didn't get along. The Sadducees were political leaders who were wealthy, and the high priest in that time of Jesus was a Sadducee, and his family was running the show. The Pharisees were the people who kept the law to the nth degree. Paul was one of those people, and so this great persecution breaks out. And two years later, is when we are meeting Paul, and we are still called Saul then, on the road to Damascus, because he is not, he's apparently eradicated all the people he needs to eradicate, or has gotten things done in Jerusalem, and he's going to Damascus in Syria to get rid of the followers of the way there. You know the story. On the way there, he is traveling and suddenly there's a bright light and he is blinded and people with him are seeing the light and they're hearing the noise but they're not hearing the words but Saul hears the word spoken to him saying Saul Saul why are you persecuting me and Saul says who are you Lord and it's Jesus who says to him I am Jesus you are persecuting. This is the moment that Paul realized, Saul realizes that he's been on the wrong team. He was led to Damascus. <laughs> this guy called Ananias was told by God, okay, you, uh, there's a guy praying, his name is Saul, and you are going to go to him and restore his sight. And Ananias like, uh, God, I've heard of this guy. And he's the guy who's been persecuting Christians, are we sure? And he's like, he's an instrument in my hands. You go. And Ananias goes. So three days, uh, Saul fasts for three days, prays and fasts for three days. You can believe that there was a lot of repentance in that time. And then Ananias goes over and restores his sight. And, Paul, and Saul was baptized. And within days of his conversion, he preached in the synagogues. And persuaded, was trying to persuade his fellow Jews, of course, then he got persecuted. So, can you believe the conversion? Can you believe that repentance? I mean, he wasn't an evil person in the sense that we think of evil. He wasn't someone who was a Satanist. He was trying to follow Jesus, or I mean God, to the best of his ability. He was trying to do everything right. He was ultra-religious, and he was completely wrong. I mean, that is scary to me, because I can be very convinced that I'm on the right track. Does that happen to you? And what if we can be just as wrong as Saul? Is that not a little bit intimidating? And so, in Joel 2, uh, 12 through 13, God is calling his people to repentance because we all go astray. Right now we live in a world that says that right is wrong and wrong is right. Black is white and white is black. Good is evil and evil is good. And we may sit and think, well, we know, but we're still affected. It's still infiltrating us. We might become overly obsessed with focusing on the world, or we may be 
uh, like me, trying not to think about it because I can't do anything about it anyway. Regardless, we might be affected by it more than we think. And Joel 2, 12 through 13 is calling us to repentance. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart. That's what repentance is. With fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Because even if we think we're all together, we're still sinning. Because right there, you're sinning because you're proud. I mean, it's kind of sucky to be a human. I mean, no matter which way you turn, you're going to miss, miss the mark, right? And as a people, maybe you yourself are in the habit of regular asking for forgiveness and repentance. But as a church, we need to ask for, we need to repent and ask for forgiveness so that there's nothing hindering what God wants to do. As a school, we need to repent and make sure there's nothing hindering God from one doing what he wants to do. As a, a city, as a, na as a state, as a nation, we need to repent together. So Jesus, or God says, rend your heart and not your garments, you know, because they used to pull out, pull apart their robes, you know, in a sign of repentance. And he's like, don't ruin your clothes. That's not what it's about. You know, tear your heart open. Stop being hard of heart. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and, and of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. You know, the return uses the, the passage that if you were involved with the Promise Keepers movement at, at all, you will know this one. It's in 2 Chronicles 7. When we get to 2 Chronicles 7, we have seen that Solomon planned for building the temple in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, prepared and built, and then finally it was done. And so we catch up with that story in chapter 7 where it says, when Solomon had finished praying, because he had prayed for the dedication of the temple in, in chapter 6, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices. That's pretty amazing, right? <laughs> Whoa, this is a real deal. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple, so much so that the priests could not enter the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the house. Um, and when all the children of Israel, so all the people who followed God saw that, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised God, the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. You know, there's, there is a cult saying that, their founder saw Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and had a conversation with him. Anywhere you read in scripture where people come face to face with, face with the one true God, the inevitable response is being on your face, you know, in awe and in overwhelmness of his holiness. holiness. So that, after that, seven days of dedication and seven days of festival, and then the eighth day was the sacred assembly. Guess what month this was in? The seventh month. Same as the Rosh Hashanah. This happened during that same time. And after all, everything was completed, God appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. And you know, the church is God's idea. And Jesus is the head of the church. This is the place he's chosen as his, for himself as a house of sacrifice. This place and the church worldwide. And then he continues to Solomon, When I shut up heaven, and there's no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land. You know that there's locust plagues all, all over the place that have gone from Africa to Asia. Have you, it's been pretty dry. We have had things burn up, right? We can relate to these things. Or send pestilence. That would be disease among the people. Are we dealing with pestilence right now? You relate to this story. If my people... And then he says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and get this, and heal their land. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This was also what was used to uh, 
promise keeper. I don't know if anybody here went, but Fred went during that uh, that men's event on the ball. There were over a million men there, and this was used. And, and he said that the men were bowed down with their faces to the ground. You could hear a pin drop. It was silent. I think that's what they're going to do on the 26th. They're going to bow their faces to the ground and humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways. And then God will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. And, and he continues to Solomon, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. It is serious, people. It is a serious time. And we can either go, oh, whatever, or we can say, it is time. One of my favorite books, I know we're not in Galatians, I just told you we're going to get in Galatians, told you a little bit about Paul, but I'm talking about repentance. And Paul certainly didn't make excuses for his previous life. In fact, he says, I'm the worst of all sinners. But in the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah hears that Jerusalem is desolate and the walls are destroyed and people are just ruining the city, is this also... I mean, have you heard about what's going on in Seattle, in Portland, in New York City? I mean, can we relate to that this is a time that we're living in? And Nehemiah isn't there and hasn't been there. He has been a cupbearer to the king for a long, long time and hearing his prayer. Because you may feel like, well, I'm doing okay. I'm not doing anything wrong. Here's what Nehemiah prays. So it was when I heard these words that Jerusalem was destroyed. That I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. Please let your ear be attentive and your eyes open that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now, day and night. For the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which, pay attention to this word, we, he wasn't there, he didn't do it, which we have sinned against you. That's the ownership. We collectively have failed. The fact that this country is where it is means that Christians didn't stay in the gap. We've handed culture over. Just the abortion rates alone should be evidence of that. We have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. He makes it even more personal. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. Remember, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, which is where, what was happening. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though some of you were cast out to the farthest parts of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people, Nehemiah continues, whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, I pray. Please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. It is time for us to take ownership of what we have failed, individually, collectively as a church, collectively as an area, and a country, and a whole world. This is a global event, actually. And I'm not doing it about the event, I just felt I feel very strongly that there is a move of the Spirit going on because people from everywhere are coming together and randomly other people are having prayer events on those say, on that same day. This is more than just humans. Something is going on and let's not miss a move of the Spirit among us. So I want to invite you, if you have not made peace with Jesus, if you are not the person, have not moved away from religion like the Apostle Paul into a deep and personal relationship with Jesus. Then Acts 3.19 tells us this, Repent, therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Come to Jesus. He has his arms open wide. He's 
paid for all of our sins. He wants a relationship with each one of us. And what do you need to do to start that? Is want to admit you're a sinner. And just like Nehemiah, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. To ask for forgiveness, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, came in the flesh, died for all our sins on the cross, but rose again on the third day, and then fourth, invite him into your heart and life to be your Savior forever. If that's you, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner, and I ask you for your forgiveness. I believe that you are the Son of God, that you've come in the flesh, and that you died for all my sins and all mankind's sins. And I want to invite you to come into my heart and life, to be my Lord and Savior forever, to start this relationship with you, Jesus. Not religion, but a relationship where I get to enjoy your peace and your love and follow you all the days of my life. I thank you in Jesus' name. And for all of us, Lord, who have already said yes to you, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to rend our hearts you would help us to humble ourselves and grieve and mourn for the mess <laughs> that we've allowed this world to, to be in. This country that was founded on, in Western, the Western world that was founded on your rules, that we've gone so far away. Help us to not think that this is someone else's problem. Help us to repent and really allow you to point out where we have fallen short and to return to you and pray and fast and take it seriously, God. Help us to not miss this moment. Help us to not just stay with business as usual. Help us to not be religious people. Help us to be faithful people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, sorry about that. If you said yes to Jesus, then contact me at office at newdaycf.org. And uh, next steps, what do we do with all this? What do we do with all this? Well, I've been sitting with this for a while and thinking about this and doing some repenting um, devotionals to help myself really understand better and go deeper. So first step, first next step may be repent for yourself. Maybe you're taking it too easy in your Christianity. Maybe you think you have nothing to repent for. In that case, repent for your pride. <laughs> and ask God what you need to repent for. Do you need to repent for bitterness? Maybe an attitude of scarcity. You know, a lot of people have, uh, you know, live with a scarcity mentality. That's not godly. How about self-pity or selfishness or laziness or arrogance or pride or hardness of heart or needing to be in control, or fear. So many people struggling with fear during this pandemic. That is not from the Lord. Anger, immorality, sexual immorality, other immorality, foul language, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, worshiping something else besides God, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy or envy, gossiping, Dissensions, divisions, drunkenness, I am sure you can add to this list. What do you need to repent for for yourself? Maybe the next step, and I would highly recommend this, whether it's the 26th or a different day, do a day of prayer and fasting to repent. If you've never fasted, fast a meal. If you can't fast a meal, give up something you like. Sugar, soda, coffee, I don't care, something. <laughs> Then maybe the next step is to repent for the church and for the school. It's a hundred-year-old church, right? And school is quite old as well. Do you think that in those years we've never done anything that was away from what God had in mind? So let's repent collectively. Get on our knees and make sure that we are following God absolutely. I don't know what God has for us. It's not my job. That's his job. My job is to follow and then lead. It's not my job to decide. You realize that. It's not your job to decide. Let's repent and then follow the Lord passionately. Let's repent for our city and state because it is crazy. Good is not evil and evil is not good. And then let's repent for our nation and maybe even our world. 
Here are some verses, and I think they're going to show up in your comments as well online. Nehemiah 1, 4 through 11. You want to read that prayer? Nehemiah 1, 4 through 11. Also, Ezekiel 18, 29 through 32 is a great section about repentance. Joel 2, 12 through 13, and then 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 15. Do not miss the moment. God is up to something. Let's not miss it. This not, may not happen again in our lifetime. And I, for one, don't want to be struck down because I was stupid. How about you? <laughs> Okay, we used to say when Harris was growing up that we're not allowed to say stupid, so, okay, sorry. Um, I'll have some announcements later, but please, please lead us in some worship as we ponder these thoughts. Thank you, Pastor Andrea, for this uh, message. And, um, I encourage us to stand to worship if you like. Um, her song will be um, a declaration that there is really nothing better than God in the world in our lives. I search the world. Oh, 
on the wall on the way out. If you are online, then uh, mail it to New Day Church or go to New Day cf.org and you can uh, donate online that way. Um, office hours are back to a fall. Uh, we're back to fall. Office hour school is in session and we had a great first week of school. Lots of kids. It was so exciting. I was here um, greeting families. It was really a great time. We're up to, I think, 1.30 maybe. Is that right? One twenty nine. Okay, okay. I'm almost over that little edge, but we need. Please pray with us. We need still fifth, sixth grade teacher. We still need daycare workers. So office hours. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, nine to three for the church office. If you want to come see us. Um, and yes. So our first week was great. Keep praying for the school because you know what. Some people like wearing the mask and think we're not strict enough, and other people think too strict so you know good luck trying to please everyone so please pray for <laughs> for the school and then the women's bible study starts tomorrow monday the 14th at 7 p.m via zoom so if that's something you're interested in uh and you haven't gotten the book you haven't signed up uh, then contact office at newdaycf.org so um let me pray for us and we'll close in uh in a song lord jesus thank you that you are the risen Savior, the Alpha and Omega, that you can turn graves into gardens and that you you can put life back where there is death, that you can turn things back into the glorious uh, design that you have for us. So would you work in us and in our lives? We thank you for what we've seen you do with the school and pray that you would do it more and that you would continue to provide in all the ways, and that you would do it for New Day Church, and that you would do it in our individual lives. Lord, you know what each one of us is struggling with. I pray that you would just meet us, and that we would be amazed, because you are so good. Even when life is hard, you are still good, and your plans are good, even when they sometimes don't feel good. So we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Have a great week, and let's worship again in song again. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all things. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory. The kingdom of all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a baby love. That you will take my face. That you will bear my cross. You lay down your life.